Hi everybody, this is Sean Overton with OneStepRemove.com and in this video I have John Person. John's a very well established trader, but uh, just to give you a little bit of his background, John, how did you get started with trading? Well, I started on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in 1977 as a runner and that was a summer job. And uh, personally, I was more interested as uh, being, I was 16 at the time. Okay. So I wasn't really interested in trading commodities. It was just a, a job to do. And uh, a lot of uh, the traders had their daughters down there. So it was a, <laughs> like a summertime uh, event. And, uh, you know, we, we it had great hours. It was kind of very early in the morning. But uh, I, uh, at the Mercantile Exchange back in those days, the uh, the big market was cattle. And I worked, uh, I started first with a company called Packers Trading, which is still in existence today. Um, and a couple of the guys, Donnie Stevens, uh, Bruce Johnson, are both uh, were governors of the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange. And um, so I, I then went on, to, you know, as I grew up, I started studying uh, economics at Loyola University downtown. And uh, one day I was on a train, okay. and a guy sitting next to me uh, was, you know, inquiring what I was studying. And uh, just to give you a description, we were we were sitting on this uh, um, train set, which uh, train station uh, setting. We, we, we called it the Brooks Brothers Express because everybody would be, you know, the professional, the accountants, the lawyers coming up uh, to the North Shore of Chicago, the northern suburbs. And this gentleman was, uh, he looked like Santa Claus in a, in a beige leisure suit. You know? <laughs> That's he's, an image. He's, he's, he stood out like a sore thumb, really, is what it was. And uh, it turned out his name was George Lane. George was the innovator and creator of the uh, indicator, uh, world famous, called Stochastics. So George uh, handed me his business card and said he was looking for a kid to, to help out, do extra work after the market's closed, and uh, to come down and see his office. And uh, he uh, said, come on down, I'll show you what we do, I'll get you lunch. And uh, about a week later, I was a starving uh, college student, and said, I'm going to give this guy a call. And um, yeah. anyway, uh, one thing led to another, and I started working for him the very next day. I was really thrilled, and, and I was amazed at, at what George did in his little, quote-unquote, war room. Um, and looking at the monitors and the way he was, in, what he was doing and trading in the markets, it really uh, appealed to me. So I worked for George for approximately two years, and... I later went on uh, my own. George was, uh, uh, I, I learned a lot about day trading and, and off uh, floor trading, screen trading from him back in those days. And his wife, Carrie, I mean, they very, very wonderful people. George passed away several years back, many of you are probably aware. But um, his wife, Carrie, continues with the investment educators in, in, in Watsika, Illinois. Um, and, and, and for me, I, I was more geared with the uh, financial arena versus trading cattle and day trading soybeans. And so I migrated with the, uh, at the time, the treasury bond futures as interest rates were declining from about 18%. And some of you may re recall back in the early 80s, we had a high level of interest rates. They were declining as we started to get into Reaganomics, so to speak. Right? Yes. And um, as, as interest rates go down, bond prices go up. And so I became very bullish on bonds. And in 1984, they introduced a... Um, a product called options and the first commodity they introduced it to was on treasury bonds so I started to migrate using options on treasury bonds and uh, from period of 84 through 86 I did extremely well in the markets and uh, you know the techniques and the tools that I used I picked up uh, um, several different uh, technical analysis techniques I, I learned stochastics and I learned the price interaction so looking at prices was very important uh, I learned about uh, pivot analysis from the floor because everyone back in those days uses day traders pivots as they're called daily pivots and I just kind of expanded instead of day trading the markets I, I used options and, and did swing and, and more position trading and, and let my positions ride back in those days. So you're, you're, you're right in the heart of the exchange. You're yeah. following the traders. You're getting all that feedback. You're listening to the noise on the pit. Right. Uh, and then you're just kind of feeling your way through it and learning the hard way. And You know, in, in back in the early 80s, it was like the revolution of technical analysis. And, and you got to realize that we had, I mean... Uh, from the 70s, all the indicators that were, you know, Wells Wilder started, you know, uh, things yeah, that RSI were the and RSI and, and looking at all the different uh, um, technical tools. I mean, John Murphy's book hadn't even been written yet, you know, and uh, what we looked at was uh, a couple books. Uh, one uh, was Who Wins, Who Loses, and Why. Tools, Harlow, and Stone was the authors. Uh, Edwards and McGee. Uh, tech, uh, uh, Arthur Sclerou with uh, Professional Techniques of a 
professional chartists. I mean, these are books that I remember the authors. I don't remember the exact titles, but these are books that you kind of studied, but then we used um, longer-term moving averages and, and looked at weekly and monthly charts. That's what I was taught to do. And so that's why I kind of got the idea of integrating longer-term work with shorter-term trading analysis in the form of pivots. So I started using one of the first in the world to, to integrate using weekly and monthly pivot analysis. And... Uh, and using other technical tools such as moving averages back in those days. So yeah, I guess that kind of highlights something I'd never thought about before. Because you mentioned before we we talked, turned on the camera, that you you know the guy that came up with the MACD histogram. You, yes. You're you're in the the boom times for technical indicators, and it's been 20 or 30 years since we've really had a revolutionary technical indicator. Why do you think that is? Well. You know, uh, first off, Tom Asprey is the one who actually helped create the histogram component uh, for Jerry Appel in his moving average convergence divergence indicator. Um, in fact, in the uh, I think this November's Stock and Commodity magazine, there's an article about MACD in there, okay. and it mentions Tom Asprey's name. And Tom and I work together, and we have an advisory service. Um, but the, the interesting aspect is we don't use MACD for any of our, our indicators. And in fact, one of the books that I wrote, Forex Conquered, I did a trading system to compare triggers using several different uh, technical tools, pivot analysis, uh, stochastics, and MACD. And what we came to the conclusion was using MACD for foreign currency uh, trades was the least productive uh, and the lowest uh, profitability trading system by just using the triggers, all else being equal to those same uh, system designs. Okay. And when you're coming up with these systems, this is all the experience that you've got from, from you trading professionally. How did you get into the, the shift from being a floor trader to where you are today? What's that What's that process and what's the balance yeah, for you? Yeah, we all use technical analysis. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, you, and like I said, everyone on the floor all had held close to their, ch their chest their numbers. You know, we, we, we looked and we knew what the support and resistance was, and you looked in the board and you saw the price. And so two things that you knew about was the price. And then, of course, the noise was, I guess you could, you could um, assimilate the noise with volume. Low, low noise levels, no volume. High noise levels, big volume. So you could see order flow coming in. Um, and, and again, the bigger the order flow, the, the heavier the noise because everyone's competing in the pit for that to, to trade off of that order flow. And, and so if you were trading large numbers in a very short period of time, like you're, you're trying to buy 500 to 3 and you know, offer them at 4, you're trying to take one tick on a 500 lot or a 100 lot, you, you know, that one tick means a lot on heavy buying. You're right there. Buy, sell. And, and if you're trading more trend and trading for a, a, a you know higher degree uh, time frame, then technical analysis really helped to, to uncover the momentum and the hidden support and resistance. So that's where pivot analysis worked and using technical tools. I mean, I studied uh, back in the day. Uh, Charles Drummond was this fictitious or supposed no one ever you know didn't know if he really existed or not, and it was uh, a technical analysis technique called Drummond geometry. Um, okay. There, there has to be. I, I believe. If there is any kind of, of technical tool, I probably applied it, used it, tried it, and I still found that the indicators and the methodology that I use to this day, what I use then, still holds true, and, and I, I still stick with that. Do you feel that there's any one magical technical indicator that's better than all the rest, or is it just kind of you use a little bit of this, a little bit of that? There isn't one single technical tool that is the Holy Grail. I believe the Holy Grail is risk management. Okay. End of story. Um, you know, there's an old phrase. Uh, whenever you're right, you're always in one. Whenever you're wrong, you're always in a hundred. So <laughs> position management and, and the, the, the trades that you feel the most confident are going to make you the money, those are generally the losers. Um, the ones that scare you to death, uh, those are generally the ones that are your, your, your higher probability winners. And I think, um, you know, there, to me, I think the, it's hard to tell this truth on a camera, but... So, uh, <laughs> Day trading is almost like a game. You can have a long-term uh, opinion of the market, a long-term being anywhere from two weeks to, to six months. That's long-term for me. Um, I think um, uh, what we call innovative, destructive, uh, innovative destruction, I guess is a better way of saying it. Innovative destruction. Innovative destruction means uh, a company like Apple discovers an iPad 
and an iPod, and therefore cassettes are no longer, they've destroyed an industry but built a new one. So innovative destruction. So with companies to have a longer term view, there's always going to be a new uh, replacement as innovative uh, creativity designs and, and, and people's ingenuity changes and people's demands change. Sure. So therefore, for me, I, I can't, economists can't predict what's going to happen three months from now. They can't sure. even figure out what our GDP is on a global scale. So I, right. I'm not going to be the one that pretends to know any more than anyone else. But sure. I could say this, for a very short-term period of time, the day trading aspect, you might have a great longer-term view of the market, but you have a couple down days in the meantime, and so if you have a bullish bias to the upside, and so you're buying breaks when you should be day trading selling rallies, that's why day trading is more of a momentum play and kind of at, at times needed to uh, disconnect your longer term view with the shorter term view of the market. A lot of retail traders like the idea of day trading and they have a lot of huge obstacles to overcome. They need to pay very high commissions that are available to the retail traders. It's incredibly time intensive. Uh, how realistic do you think it is for the average retail guy to pull it off and to day trade successfully? All right, so day trading, um, you know, when you say high cost, today day trading commission rates are so inexpensive compared to 20, 30 years ago. Uh, people could day trade. There was a man named Barry Lind who passed away this year. We lost Barry Lind. We lost, uh, by the way, uh, Joe Granville, famed technician who created On Balance Volume. Joe passed away September 7th of this year. So we, we lost a couple icons in the industry. Barry Lind was the first who, Lind Wal who created Lind Waldock in Chicago, a, a, a commodity firm who had the idea of offering discount commissions. So okay. for day trading, back in, I'm going to say, the, the mid to late 80s, a discount commission was $38 round turn on a, <laughs> on a futures contract. And I think most people can day trade an E-mini S&P right now for under $5. Yeah. So, you know, I guess, you know, when you say the expense, it's uh, with today's uh, uh, business, if you think of how we've gone from uh, trading in commissions then to trading commissions now, the cost of doing business. But that doesn't mean that you still have to pay for Internet, you have to pay for technology, new laptops, et cetera, et cetera, sure. monitors. So you have equipment it costs but for the uh, individual investor I think the biggest the biggest biggest obstacle is um, uh, self okay self is the big, biggest os obstacle um, to be able to have the patience and the discipline to wait for the setup most people will force a trade they uh, will anticipate a signal try to beat them the system or beat the indicator or you know anticipate what's going to happen next and you have to kind of go with the flow of the market, and so for um, there are some some important variables. We've seen shifts in, in um, time of day moves of the markets. It used to be that lunch hour was no longer applicable, and then it was like the lowest volume period. But we have this phrase called the noon balloon. A lot of times, at least on the eastern uh, coast, uh, or, you know, eastern standard time in, in U U.S., we have uh, been seeing in 2013 and some of later of 2012 better moves during the lunch hour from 12 to 2 than we had uh, you know, after the uh, U.S. Open outcry. We, we also get better moves sometimes during the European Open session. So from 3 to 5 a.m. we get uh, better uh, trend trades. So what just about the time you figure things out, it, it, it changes on you. Yeah. So how, how realistic do you think it is? A lot of guys have this idea that they're going to go buy some robot or some system on the Internet and it's just going to work for the next five years and they're moving to the beach and sipping martinis. Yeah, they'll be sipping martinis, uh, possibly wooing over their losses. Because I think <laughs> due, due to the fact that, that um, demand changes, um, markets change. Look what we had with the, the you know, 30-year Treasury bonds. You know, benchmark bonds are no longer the benchmark. It's the tenure, and it's probably the the 90-day. You know, we don't even have T-bill trades anymore in the yeah, library it's zero. because it's, it's interest rates are at zero. So there's a change, and um, there is going to be uh, changes in, in the marketplace. And so for those who uh, want to day trade in the market, I think you can't be locked in. We've seen this uh, situation in equities this year where you see a lot of individual stocks with increased volatility but not the overall indices. We've looked at the VIX which is trading at uh, let's just call it an average of 13. Right. Okay. I mean it, it might dip to 1280, it might go to 14, but the average is around 13 in the VIX for the last six months. And the VIX is a volatility index based on the S&P 500 out of the money uh, and in the money uh, uh, puts and calls. So um, 
if you take a look at implied volatility on some of the options on Priceline, on Google, on uh, uh, Cisco, Facebook, uh, individual stocks, uh, even looking at biotechnology names, Serapta Therapeutics, uh, looking at Biogen, Amgen, uh, looking at Merck, Pfizer, looking at implied volatility in some of these stocks, you're seeing uh, in, you know incredible moves on individual stock basis, but not on the overall indexes. So I think there's there's kind of this disconnect are people trading uh, if they're looking at the index but then they're missing opportunities on individual stocks sure and then what stocks are moving sometimes you see this rotational effect where you see technology which was a laggard this year earlier in the year everyone was wondering when was everyone might not remember this you know it's funny how traders you know mindset moves but in the beginning of, of 2013 technology wasn't moving everyone's saying when is technology going to catch up and then all of a sudden come June 19th when Ben Bernanke said, said quantitative easing forever the technology sector moved up regional banks exploded the KRE for example uh, is a exchange traded fund that represents the regional bank sector uh, we saw an incredible move and 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 the the technology uh, sector, especially the IIX or internet uh, name stocks, you take a look at. Yeah, your, we're in the middle of the IPO boom. Twitter uh, just came out. And, and and but you know, see, still you had moves where eBay won't move, but Amazon does move. So it's it's a hit or miss, and not all companies are created equally. And yet, it's been a very confusing market. And all of a sudden, what happened is technology the. Uh, as, as represented by the NASDAQ 100, has outperformed uh, the majority sectors of the market. So they got their answer. It finally caught up. So if a, if a retail trader is focused on one thing and not looking at, at, at you know, like transportation in different segments of the markets, uh, you know, these, these investment flows change. And, and one thing that might help people is to look at, to anticipate those changes, is also to, to look at seasonal uh, factors because different sectors um, perform better at certain times of the year than others. Yeah, so I mean, the idea that you're just going to trade e minis and you have one system, that's not at all how you trade. At no. all, not, at, not even. All right, so let's bit. take a look at this, this example about sector rotation. So you, you have the mindset that you, you're waiting for a buy signal, you're bullish in the overall market. Your, your advanced decline comparative ratio analysis says, hey, we've got a breakout, more performing stocks. Your market breadth is what it's called. Your market breadth is, is increasing. Your volume is increasing. So you see a healthy um, uh, you know, market condition in, in the uh, S&Ps. But that might not exist in the, in the small cap, the Russells. It might not exist in the diamond. The, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. But all of a sudden you take a look at the IYT, the transportation sector, or you, you look at um, maybe the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, and you say, gee, not everything's uh, performing well. So I want to be a day trader, and I want to buy the S&Ps, right? But all of a sudden I'm getting a stronger breath, stronger analysis in the NASDAQ. So a trader, what retail traders struggle with is they don't feel comfortable switching from buying S&P futures to buy NASDAQ because if you have a stronger reading and stronger uh, analysis tools or maybe your breadth and health analysis is saying there's potentially more interest in the technology, instead of day trading the long side of the S&Ps, try day trading the long side of the NASDAQ. Inversely, inversely, just to, to add this, if let's say you're bearish and you're near resistance targets, okay. all right, and one of my favorites is monthly pivots or quarterly pivots, and all of a sudden I'm starting to see a breakdown in weakness in the small cap as measured by the Russell. Instead of taking day trading sell signals or breakdown momentum failures, stop in, so to speak, on S&P 500, I should be looking at the Russell. But retail traders, they don't it's like change bothers people. And they don't want to go from, okay, I should be selling the S&Ps. Uh, I want to sell the S&Ps, but I should be selling the, the, the Russell. Right. And so, therefore, you have to change your, your scope of what these indices are doing. So if you're day trading or you're a systems trader, how do you actually go about doing that? Because some people have the problem that they trade willy-nilly. One day they're an oil trader, and then the next day they're trading some random instrument, and then they're trading Forex and now they're options, and they're just bouncing around between losing strategies. Oh, wow. Okay, well, here's the thing. During, for day trading, you have, uh, one of the things that I like to look at is, and on my screens, um, certain times of the year I will look at the relationship between 30-year treasury bonds okay. and the stock indices. This is the time of the year 
the fourth quarter, where a lot of times you'll see bonds and stocks move in tandem. So it's not a good um, indicator to use. For the rest of the year, a lot of times what you see is when stocks go up, bonds go down. Okay. Regardless of quantitative easing, on an intraday basis, there's one technique that you'll see S&P's uptick and you'll see bonds downtick. That's a good confirmation. Another great confirmation is when I have an indicator. Now, whatever your indicator is, if you, if you get um, four of the top trading markets, which would be the S&P's, the NASDAQ 100, the Russell 2000, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So you got four of the top indices that we could day trade in. And, and, I, use, and I look at those markets in, in three different time frames. Typically, it's a 5-minute, a 15, and a 60. And so if I can see that the, for day trading purposes, that all of these markets are in sync and they're all in a buy mode together, then I'm going to look for taking the shorter term buy signals because it tells me that it's a broad based rally and there's inherent strength in the market. Okay. All right, next. So those are, those are some day trade techniques to make sure that you have confirmation across the spectrum of those indices in, in their respective times. Day trading purposes. Um, Ten to one or the other. For currencies, sometimes we see we've seen the British pound move, and other times you see the euro currency have better moves. Sure. All right. So for looking at a foreign currency, for day trading purposes, year in and year out, it's the euro currency. For day trading purposes, you get momentum out of crude oil because it's it, 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 in, in more times than you don't. But crude oil scares people. And you can't use a higher degree time frame for day trading, like a 15-minute chart or even a 5-minute. You have to go to a 3 and a 1-minute and look for patterns and breakouts and be quick with your uh, risk as well as your, your profit objectives. Yeah. And then last but not least, I just want to say gold. Gold is another momentum play. There's okay. a lot of volume. There's a lot of action in gold on a global scale. And so for day trading purposes, that's another market that one could look at. Okay, so you're you're always scanning different sectors, and before you even apply whatever system it is that you have, you're looking for the best opportunity, and then putting your system in that that little niche for where you think is best right now. So for day trading, those are the markets that I look at. Okay. All right. For position trading, I look for stocks, and I look for seasonally strong sectors. And then I scan for buy signals of stocks within that sector. Do you focus on stocks because the seasonality is better? Uh, I think in the last, since the, the March 2009 low, I probably focus more on stock trading than I have actual commodity trading because <coughs> we've had such an advantageous um, era of, of less capital. Um, and with commodity pricing, when we have crude oil over $100, when you have gold over $1,500, for et cetera, you know, your capital requirements on, on margins They're are astronomical. And you don't have the uh, ability to use, and I hate to say this on, on a recording, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> commodity options really aren't well priced. They, the, the bid and ask is very wide. So it's very tough to get a trade off and, and use some type of an option strategy in the commodity markets. Okay. What I would, what you can use since the advent of uh, ETFs, is there's so many uh, liquid ETFs that you can use that are less capital intensive, right. and uh, options on those. So we could use, um, for example, if you're bearish, the gold miners. If you're bearish on gold, you can use uh, an exchange traded fund called Dust DUST. If you're bearish gold, you have. Um, GLL, you, you have uh, one that's a uh, very low capital required. It's not a huge mover. Uh, DZZ is the stock symbol. Uh, at the time of this recording, it was trading somewhere in the six seventy to seven dollar range. So as you can see, it's a uh, you know when gold was priced at approximately thirteen twenty, DZZ was around six twenty. Uh, gold fell to approximately twelve sixty. DZZ was around seven oh five. So you can get about a 10% swing on an ETF, which might not sound like a lot, but on a thousand like shares, a lot <laughs> yeah, on a thousand shares, a six thousand dollar investment, that I can manage the risk and and trade a swing trade. Uh, if I'm bearish gold or looking for a breakdown in gold, I have other advantages rather than putting up an incredible amount of of capital and being exposed to inherent leveraged risk. And you talk about risk a lot, but. I've noticed when I talk to different traders, the word or the bu the buzz phrase risk management means different things to different people. What does risk management mean to you? Don't lose. 
<laughs> if you are going to lose, make sure it's not a lot. Okay. Um, that's risk management, not being overly positioned in the market. So is that just a sexy term for stop? Um, yeah, risk management is definitely a stop. You have to have a stop. I always look at, uh, when I look for a, a, a buying or selling opportunity in the marketplace, um, the first thing I look at is what my entry is. The okay. very next step is where is my risk. Okay. Because the profit will take care of itself. Uh, I do have profit objectives, but either my profit objectives aren't quite met or my profit objectives are well exceeded. But I do know what my risk factor is. And with my risk factor and with my entry, I can then determine, now I know what my risk is, how many positions should I be in, in accordance to my account. Do you always follow a fixed fractional money approach where you're, you're going to risk half a percent on this trade every time? Or do you... Uh, to a degree, yeah. On stocks, I like to uh, maybe risk... Uh, 5% of the trade. So, okay. for example, uh, if we have a $10 stock or a $50 stock, right? If it's a $50 stock and if my risk needs to be not based on price but on where my stop needs to be based on uh, chart level, support right. levels, if it exceeds 5%, I kind of will look for other opportunities. Okay. So I, I try to match... You know, typically I like to not risk much more than 5%. And if I do, then another thing I do is execution, is another uh, um, technique that very few people talk about. I'll stagger my orders. Okay, so, so you're not just going all in when you see the trade. No, I think one of the things that we could do is uh, teach people to stagger orders. I'm going to buy 50% of the position here. If my stop has to be 8%. I'll buy 50% here, place my stop, and I'm going to buy the other 50% a little lower, and so then my average cost getting into the trade. So by the time my methodology gives me a buy signal, it's based on maybe a breakout or it's a buy signal, and I'm looking for a snapback, a pullback. I'm looking for a regression to the mean. Sure. So sometimes I'm going to get it uh, more than I think less than I think, not get in, or sometimes we, you know, we we do it just right. I've always I've always tried trading, and whenever I've done the leg in approach, it always feels like you get that first fill, and then the market zooms up, and your, your big order never gets filled. How do you deal with that psychologically? Uh, it, it, I'm, I'd rather have some of the tail of the dog than uh, get bit from the the hand that's feeding me. So okay. uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's you know it, it does happen. Execution is a, is a big. Uh, component of trading. You can have the great ideas, you can do all the system analysis and you know um, do all this this research and you know you don't get into the trade. It hits your price, it hits your price. Many of your day traders out there may be day trading S&Ps and they, they go, okay, I'm gonna, I got a sell signal so I'm gonna look for the market to, to snap back. So they have limit offers and say you're selling at 73 quarter. All right, so 73 even, 73 quarter, 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 and you're sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you're watching that thing just hit that offer. You're looking at the dome, and it's 1,200, now it's 900, now it's 800, now it's 600, now it's 363, and you're like, yeah, 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 my little three lot, that's me, I'm in there, I'm there. The next thing is 70, 69, and then, and then the thing just falls out of bed, and you're unable. So um, execution, getting filled. There's a lot of times we miss trades in the market. And that's just part of the game? And that's part of the business. So there's, the, you know... I was told in, the, in, in this market, in this business, and it's not too far off of execution. It's it's uh, taking the other extreme. Is that when you're in a trade, okay? There's there, and you're in a bad trade. There's three things you can do in this world: double up, spread it off, or get out. That's it. In execution, you're either going to get filled, you're not going to want it, right? Yes. Or you're not going to get as much as you want. It's part of the game. It's part of the business. Okay. And, and, and I think for day trading, it's immediate. And for position trading, I can follow the market. And, and, and if I really like the stock over time, I can trail an entry. Another technique that I really like to teach is people are adamant about just price entry. What do you mean by that? Okay, so you put an order to buy and the market pulls back and you put 50% to buy here. So you have a buy signal. If you're, if you're using a let's call it a, um, a system that gives you buy signals at the end of the week. So you're using weekly charts, right? Okay. Okay, well, the market, the prior week, opened on either Sunday night or Monday morning's open outcry and closed on a Friday. So you have an open-close relationship. So open, close. If it's bullish, close will be greater than open. Right. And then maybe you get a pullback earlier in the week. So you're looking for that pullback. So in the, in the, if the market's truly bullish, what are the components that define a bullish trend? Okay, most people will probably say, well, gee, duh, higher high, higher lows. 
Okay. I was going to say I can think of a thousand different ways to describe it. Well, you're a programmer. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> but um, a bullish trend to me is not just only a higher high, but more importantly in an uptrend, a bullish trend is higher lows. Uh, but most importantly, the close is greater than the open. The close is greater than past or prior closes. The close is also greater than past or prior highs. Okay. And a, a close that's greater than a past high is automatically determined to be greater than the close. Because the high supers is like having a you know four of a kind. It trumps a full house, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. And then more importantly, the close is stochastics and some other indicators teach us is that the close is closer to the current bar or past bar's highs. So there are probably six of the most important elements of what defines a quality uptrend. And that is higher high, higher low, close greater than open, close higher than past or prior closes, close greater than uh, past or prior highs, and the close is closer to the current bar's high. So there's my six definitions, which is a lot better than saying, oh yeah, higher high, higher low. So with that said, how do you execute? What's your execution? So if you're looking at a weekly chart, you have Monday, you're looking, you might get a pullback between Monday and Friday. There's your five-day window on a weekly chart. So maybe you want to enter in some positions at the beginning of the week and make sure that you average in your position by the end of the week. Okay, so there's a timing component. That's what I was just saying. Yes. Okay. So price, people focus on price. No, good job, only. Sean. Huh? <laughs> You're like, good job, Sean. You yeah. got on. <laughs> so um, people focus on price, but they don't focus on time. And remember, when you look at a chart, there's the time axis, then there's the price axis. Right. And so there is a, a very valid component of just using time itself to... Improve your fills? So you're looking for a market to pull back, and you're looking for the pullback to get you your best possible price. And over time, you don't get it. Then you need to maybe bump your entry up. So when you think about risk management, you think about your entry signal, and you think about the execution where we're talking about the limit orders, where would you rank those in the relationship between them? Well, um, obviously, you don't have to worry about risk if you don't get filled on an execution. Touche. <laughs> so the... Uh, you know, an old floor trader at the Chicago Board of Trade told me, if you've done your work and you like the trade, get in it. Worry about the risk later. And later is a very vague word. It is. That's dangerous, potentially. But it's not that dangerous. So if you think about it, one of the other techniques is that I'm looking to buy the market on a pullback. I'm bullish, and I'm looking for a pullback. Okay. Right? And the market, like, think of it breathing. It expands, it contracts, it expands, it contracts. So I'm buying, I'm trying to buy that contraction. Right. If I get the contraction over time and I can't get filled and it starts to move away, I can buy it here. My stop no longer has to be here. If I couldn't get filled here to begin with, why do I have to put my stop way down there? I mean, if I can't get filled here and I'm buying here, I can move my stop up. Okay. So that content of that, what that essence of that meaning is, if you like the trade, get in now. Figure out your stop later. Okay. It didn't mean figure it out a year from now. It means just get in to the market because the markets tend to not wait around. It, but they don't send you the email or the tweet saying, come on in, we're getting ready to really rally. And <laughs> okay. you know, there's another very famous phrase of mine, and it comes from experience. The market will always let us in every single loser. It hardly ever likes to let us in on all the winners. So we have to take... We have to be observant and take proactive measures to get into a trade. So how do you balance the emotion? Because we also discussed in this interview that you're most likely to take your biggest trade on the ones that are going to lose. But we also have to balance that with getting filled so you're not panicking trying to force a trade. How do you reconcile those Again, it's, it's over risk. It okay. really is. You know, so let's say, for example, you're day trading and you're normally a, a three or four lot trader trading E-mini S&Ps. Okay. And I've got a great setup. One of my proprietary, let's say a short position is my low closed OG pad. And uh, I get a, 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 you know, across all four top indices, we got sell signals at the same time. Every 15 minute bar that concluded all gave generated sell signals. We're in a daily sell mode. I can't get any better than this. All right. So my risk is now, say, five points. Okay. That's, you know, five times four ticks per point, so you're 20 ticks. So it might be out of your comfort area. So immediately I'd say, well, gee, uh, I only, you know, should normally only risk maybe eight to 12 ticks on a trade on okay. an S&P, but this setup is so uh, reliable and it has a high probability that Instead of doing maybe a five lot or a four lot, I'm going to drop it down and, and reduce my lot size to a two lot. 
Okay. And then I can micromanage maybe adding on to the position if it starts to uh, generate uh, a trend condition, and I can add to the position. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if that I- explained about how do you determine your lot size. I think a lot of people get, there's a, a lot of things that need to go on, and people, it's hard for them to process the data. For example, I only want to trade E-mini S&Ps, but the NASDAQ is weaker this time, or the Russell's giving me better sell signals. I should forget selling the, the E-minis, because I you sell an E-mini and I get four ticks. I sold the Russell, and I could have gotten ten points, right? <laughs> so the relative strength analysis helped me to determine that the the Russell was the weakest of the indices, and if I'm going to take a sell signal, take it in the Russell. Right. So that thought process, I would say, retail new traders struggle with getting out of the old habit of you know switching products. Right. Number one. Number two. There's a lot going on with the excitement of first off, I got to get in a trade with the fear component of. I could lose on this trade, and so trying to figure out quickly how many lots should I be in, and reducing lot size or increasing lot size, and and stretching positions over time. So there's a lot of different components that really need to be addressed to traders that I don't think they do. Okay, so well, unfortunately the reality of the retail trading market is that most traders lose. And for the people that are in that situation, if you could give them one thing to focus on, for the average trader, what would you suggest? Okay, so the first thing that you have control over is your mouse. You can click it and you cannot click it. That's what you have control over the market immediately. So you do have the power of control. Um, and, and the next thing is you have the power of control of staggering your entries. And I think that's another thing that people fail to do. Okay. You know, they get in that mindset, and it's like, I've got to do this, I've got to do this every single trade. Yeah. And, and another thing that I was taught early on was that, let's say you're in a trade, and you don't like it, and here you are in this big position. Who says you can't scale out? Get out of half your position, cancel your stops, and change it to your new order, reducing your, your risk. So, for example, let's say I get a, a, a pattern that, um, one that maybe uh, a typical chart pattern that people might relate to, and... and, and uh, let's call it an M top formation, okay. and it breaks down, and you see that momentum, and it's, there's volume associated with it, and it should be really just plunging because you know when markets start to move lower, it's you know they, they, as the old saying, tops take longer to form than bottoms, and all of a sudden market starts to cave, 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 and it just stops and stalls. It's like wait a minute. This market is sending an email invitation to everyone to get short, and markets don't do that. So the mor- moral of the story is, if a market should go down and it doesn't, if they can't take it down, they generally will take it back up. So in, if nervous, but you don't have the, the structural reason to cover the entire trade, then what you can do is cover a portion of the position. And I think that's one of the things is tr- a position adjustment size people don't do. Okay, and while we're focusing on execution, mainly we've been talking about your manual execution, the things that you control. Without bashing any brokers, have you noticed differences between where you execute your orders and the actual performance of your trading? Well, if you're thinking, you know, I think from a, um, I think nowadays electronics, for, let's let's take it to different markets. Uh, stock trading, routing, uh, every stock brokerage firm from uh, one I use is uh, Thinkorswim through TD Ameritrade. Um, interactive brokers, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, I mean, all the guys out there, they all pretty much have, a, you know, an E-Trade, and I'm sure there's some that I'm missing and I don't want to leave anyone out, but uh, they all have that order routing system. I mean, if you have it, I need it, they have it, we all have it. We need to be competitive. So the technology of order routing is, is extremely competitive. So for, for equities traders, um, you know, you're not going to be maybe that high-frequency trading that gets that extra millisecond, nanosecond uh yeah, you're not going to compete there. You know, but I'm not one that's trying to do uh, 500 shares of IBM and trade the teenies. I'm not that type of trader, so that's not my business model. Sure. Right? Um, I think, so you have to look at what your order execution over time is uh, in, in different markets. When you look at an ETF, when you look at a futures position, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages that people have nowadays? And for order execution, you know, you, you're going to have... Limit orders not get filled. And if you're, if you're looking to enter in a trade, so for example, in a bullish setup, okay. I'm thinking the markets, it, 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 it gave me a buy signal, I'm looking for a pullback. It pulls back, it hits me, it hits me, it hits me. So I have a limit bid order to buy into the market. 
Um, I could go market order, right? Or I could have that limit bid. So all of a sudden, I think with retail traders is, you know, in the content that the market will never let you in on the winners. How do you combat that? Well, if if the market starts to move back away from your limit, you might have to place a subsequent order at the same time, a limit bid and a stop entry. So okay. if you don't get filled, you have the ability to click on. If one's filled, cancel the other. Okay. And that way, if the market does move in the, in, in the intended direction that your research or your indicators have shown, at least you're going to go with the trade. And the next thing is to exit the position with a profit, which is something we haven't even talked about as, as, and because I think if your trade and your research is right and your risk management is correct, the profits take care of themselves. Okay, so do you think the entry is more important than the exit? Or I do. I mean, okay. it's kind of like what's more important, taking off on a plane or landing? Well, um, but if you're in the air, the takeoff was fairly important, and now landing is more important, right? Because okay. you've already taken off. So, um, uh, you know, y if you don't have good entry uh, and you have great analytics and you're not getting filled ever, then that's a major problem. Yeah, well, I, I want your signals because I know it's time to buy. <laughs> that's right. So, boy, and I can't get into the trade. So maybe your it's your execution and, and you're too stringent in, in where you're placing your limit bids. Okay, and a lot of traders are completely ignoring this thing. So that a lot of them I know from my experience watching them come up with their systems is they, they're looking at this moving average cross or this RSI and they're trying to find unique technical indicators to, find, to put them in the right direction. Do you think that's a waste of time or do you think that that's, you just need something to get going and then it's really about focusing on the details? Well, I, I think what's important is that everyone understands what a technical tool is designed to tell you. That's your job as a trader is to find out what are the tool that I'm using? And I think you've got to understand that you need to use non-correlated but yet corroborating indicators. And so <clears throat> for me, I'll use a moving average component. I don't use moving averages based on the close. I use a proprietary moving average um, based on other variables. I also use moving averages um, in my pivot analysis that's based on a pivot point, which is the high-low close divided by three rather than a close. Um, so a lot of people devising systems and developing moving average components, they use like your standard for stock traders. You always hear about the fabled 20, 50, 100, and 200 day moving average. Or are they weighted? They're, but the simple, exponential, it doesn't matter, but they're all based on a close, right? You have other systems out there that you, de de you know, if you're looking to smooth out over time what the value of the market is based on a close, that's one trading system. Another trading system that might be better to see if there's a momentum uh, move up or down is taking moving average of highs or moving average of, of lows. Those are called moving average channels. So developing an indicator or developing a signal, it all depends on what you're looking to, for the indicators to tell you. What are you looking for? Trending, breakout, and that's the difference. Uh, an RSI, Relative Strength Index, is, is going to tell you if the market's overbought, oversold, relative to that time period that it's constructed. Just like a moving average convergence divergence or stochastics. It's going to give you an indicator based on like for MACD, 12, 26, 9. So it's going to give you a, a later entry on a buy because it has to go through all that time to to generate a signal. And so by the time you get a buy signal, it might be later okay. than earlier. So people need to understand what is it that these technical tools are designed to, to give me. Okay. And that, I think, for most people, they fail to use breath, they fail to use uh, volume. I think a lot of traders now, and I'd like to really share this with your audience. Yeah, please. Um, Many of you, if you've ever looked at a trending market condition, you've looked at the volume histogram, you say, gee, this market's moving up and there's no volume, it can't go any higher, therefore I'm going to go short, or I don't believe in it. You may miss the move. Well, if you think about it in the last, say, now eight years, I keep saying five, and then you've got to keep adding years. Everybody. Yeah, the, the problem with time is it always changes. <laughs> it changes. Time changes, <laughs> just as yeah. the markets change, right? So you have to change your development style. So. It, when you look at the, the exchange traded funds, and you look at the popularity of options, and you look at the, the uh, uh, increase in popularity of, uh, of expansion into hedge, fund, hedge funds due to regulatory reform and changes, 
um, more people are becoming educated and, and steering off trading just the indexes and just the stocks. So therefore, where's the volume and how is it, it, it changing? It, it can be volume could be masked. It can be masked in the simple form that I don't need to buy a stock. I, I can buy uh, a stock option. I can do a simple uh, sell a put and buy a call and get in a synthetic long position, and that's not going to show up in the volume of the underlying instrument. So therefore, there's a better uh, technical tool we use to measure the strength of a trend. It's called uh, on balance volume, created by Joe Granville. But there's other things that an individual trader can do by creating a, uh, a system. So an on balance volume is a, is a line chart. It measures the, the, the relative change of uh, volume on an up day versus a down day, right? So it's based on the close. Okay. All right. So it's not going to give you internal, you know, market structure changes. It's going to be based on the close. So did the is if the close of price is higher than the prior day, then we should see an uptick in if it's a strong day, an uptick in the on balance volume reading. Right. So is that new reading in on balance volume on balance volume higher than it was ten days ago? Well, you might not pick that up because you're not paying attention to that. So what you can do is put an overlaying moving average on that indicator, putting an indicator on an indicator. And now I can be alerted to a, a, a system that says if price reaches uh, above X, if price reaches above the three-day average uh, uh, high if uh, price is above the close of the last five days, so you have your algorithms determining a bullish momentum shift to the upside, and if the on-balance volume crossed above its eight-day simple moving average, then generate buy signal. Okay. Or an alert that you can scan for that says, gee, here's a stock that populates on, on a buy that I can take further uh, look into. And you, you really do follow that if-then process. If, 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 then, and then now you're looking for execution. Last I checked, that's how we... Uh Code stuff. I could be wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong. I only highlight it because most people overlook it. They think I, I kind of do this, and then when I see the stock looks like it's it's strong. Yes. You know, they they look at things that they can't quantify, and I've noticed that a lot of people have a really hard time even explaining what it is they do. And when you can step back and you say, if this, if this, and if it's concrete, then you can measure it and you can adjust and you can see if it's working or not. Yeah, and you know, we can sit there. And so, if you notice that I use, uh, I've talked about price, I've talked about volume, and I've talked about some proprietary indicators, and I've not talked about any of the other popular or stochastics or any of the other popular indicators, and I certainly don't use them because I, I just think they're a Redundant, and if I do use them, I'm looking at them in a in, in not a nice way. I'm looking at them in a way that um, if I'm already in a trade, I want to see what those indicators are saying because if they're starting to just finally get into a buy, remember, in order if I'm long a market and I need to sell, I need to sell to someone who's willing to buy. And the only reason someone's going to be willing to buy is if those indicators are just now finally flashing into a buy. Excellent. So, I mean, I hate to be cynical. I guess that's the word I was looking for. Most traders are pretty cynical. Uh, it is a, a situation for, you know, it's a zero-sum game. I mean, we need bad analysts out there to do bad trades so that the good analysts can make money. Because yeah. it's a zero-sum game to a degree. Yeah, it's just the basics and the reality of it. So, John, I think we're out of time. But uh, if somebody wants to find you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Just visit our website, Persons Planet. It's, a, uh, um, it's our... our um, Mother, I, I think uh, the headquarters, the mothership. The mothership. <laughs> it shows where we have our, you know, indicators, and, and if we're doing a seminar or teaching, or have our, our university program. Excellent, everybody. Thank you for watching.